I tried to read everything I can about World War II, especially the Nazis. I mean, I think every guy is like that. I'm, I'm certainly like that. And this one for me is, you know, I, I obsess over World War II. You know, I've mm. consumed every, but this was a story about World War II I never heard of. Yeah. And I was like, how did I not hear of this? This is a secret plot to kill Winston Churchill, Joseph Stalin, and FDR at the height of World War II. I'm like, how do I not know this story? And and I found it on the internet of all things, and the internet's not good for much these days, yeah. but man, it has uh, historical facts that were obscure. And I found this story, it was about a half page, page long, and I just went down the rabbit hole. And mm -hmm. we spent the last two years doing research, uh, having, we hired people who speak Russian and German so we can find out and read some Nazi diaries. We were all in on this, and uh, the Nazi conspiracy is one of the craziest stories you've never heard. So this is, I mean, people know, obviously, like, there was a tough time trying to bring together, you know, between Stalin and Churchill and Roosevelt, like, trying to bring these three together to make this thing work, to oppose all the fascism and, and, and all the, you know, the, the access, uh, access powers of that time. It was not an easy thing. And so they're trying to go through this process, and this is kind of where this plot takes place. Yeah, so it's 1943. It's obviously the height of the war, and Joseph Stalin wants us to invade continental Europe. He's getting decimated by the Nazis. He's like, I need your help. We're sending uh, weapons, of course, but he's like, no, no, come and invade the east, what becomes eventually the battle of, and, and the invasion of Normandy. Mm -hmm. And FDR realizes we got to get on the same page. Bring And, and he, he's the middleman because Churchill and Stalin hate each other. And he's like, we got to get the big three together. I'm going to bring in Churchill. I'm going to bring in Stalin. Make sure they come to this thing. It's in Tehran, Iran. Of all places. Because Joseph Stalin demands it's there. They say, how about Alaska? How about somewhere close? How about somewhere go distant? No, he wants Tehran because there's a railroad there. He has an, an embassy there. He knows security is good there. And the desert will provide secrecy. So here's the moment. FDR flies to Tehran. He's got the motorcade coming down the center of the city. Everyone's waving at the motorcade. They're all trying to crane their necks and get a look at the president. And the president's waving back. But what none of them know is the person in the car is not the president. It's a Secret Service decoy. The actual president, the real FDR, is ducked down in the back of a beat-up sedan across the city. He's flying through the side streets because they're worried there's a Nazi assassin who's going to murder him. And I just ruined chapter one of the Nazi conspiracy, but that's the opening chapter of the book. Jeez. And the... I, I, the this is one of those things that it's hard to believe it was real, right? Like, it's hard to believe. You, I guess, you know, Hitler gets wind of something like this. He's going to try to do something about it. But, I mean, they really, what could have happened if this was successful? I mean, the entire world could have changed. No, and that's exactly, and you'll, you'll see exactly how close it comes. There's a, because we all know the stories of FDR and we know Winston Churchill. We've heard those names. We know Joseph Stalin. Those are all popular names. But I love the people you've never heard of. There's a guy named Otto Skorzeny in the book. He's a Nazi. And Otto Skorzeny gets paged to go to Adolf Hitler's secret headquarters, the Wolf Slayer. And when he gets there, it's because Hitler is bringing together all his special ops guys. He wants to find the toughest one, the best fighter. He lines them all up shoulder to shoulder in a big room, and he quizzes them with one question. What do you think of Italy? And they all give their answers, saying, oh, Italy's on our side, and we'll fight to the death with them. But Nazi, Otto Skorzeny, shouts above everybody else that he says, I am from Austria, my Fuhrer. And what he's gambling on is he knows that Adolf Hitler's from Austria, and a true Austrian forever resents Italy because in World War I, a key piece of Austria was taken by Italy and never given back. And Adolf Hitler turns to this Nazi, Otto Skorzeny, he's like, you're my guy. And he sends him on a secret mission. And when you see the secret mission, it's so bananas <laughs> that we, we literally said to the editor, you need to put a photograph. Josh mentioned I, my co writer, said, well, you've got to put a photograph in the pages of the book because no one will believe it really happened, this secret mission. You'll see the moment of the mission. It earns Otto Skorzeny the name the most dangerous man in Europe. And I'm telling you, you've never heard this story. It's the wildest Nazi adventure you've ever not heard of. Yeah, it's amazing. Do you, is it surprising to you now, like, look the way the world is today, that, that, all these different countries with different belief systems and totally different systems were able to come together and recognize there was a real enemy on the other side and to work together to even have a meeting like that. Well, you know, and, and the, the way we tell the story in the United States is, you know, we tell the story, we punch the Nazis in the jaw, we save the day for democracy, and it almost seems like a foregone conclusion that good was going to beat evil. Yeah. But it wasn't like that, because just as you said, there's all these different reasons. It's not, you know, the Allied powers, even when you look at them, obviously the United Kingdom and the United States stand strong together. But the only reason the Soviet Union was on our side, they weren't on our side in the beginning of the war. 
They were actually with the Nazis yeah. at the beginning of the war. They switched sides when Hitler invades, and they're like, oh, we should probably join the Allies because we're getting our butts kicked. Yeah. And, and it's not that they're on the good guys in this moment. Stalin's a bad guy. He's doing things back then that are, you know, just a, an authoritarian who's, you know, running around with just as much death going on, obviously until World War II. Um, and to try and hold this kind of alliance together, it's precarious. It's one of those things you realize, when, especially when you watch this, that everything is kind of hanging on by a thread. And luckily, FDR is the right man for the job at that moment in time because he's, he's a good charmer. He knows how to charm Stalin. He knows how to charm Churchill. Yeah, that's an interesting part because, I mean, uh, you know, you have the molotov ribbentrop uh, pact where Soviets, Germans, they're together. And, like, there's no better way to break up a pact by completely invading the guy here in the pact with. It tends right? like, to ruin a good party. <laughs> it tends to ruin that. But, like, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that we would even work together at that point. I mean, it, they were dealing with so much terror on their, uh, during that particular, uh, uh, you know, chapter of, the, of, of World War II where they needed help. But, like, the idea that we would all work together and, and make sure that this went down the way it did, it was not a foregone conclusion. And I actually think some of it is just because Hitler had two giant, among many, miscalculations, right? One of them, of course, we all know is he thinks Russia is going to, he thinks the Soviets are going to give up. Yeah. They're not going to fight that strong. And, of course, that's, uh, he's wrong. They're going to fight to the death, which they do. Um, but the other miscalculation he makes is about America itself, right? They tell him this, it never had to be an alliance when we didn't want to be in World War II. You know, right? Like, we, after World War I, we lost so many people here. We didn't want to fight again in another war across the world. And the stock market crashes. FDR is elected to save the country from ruin. It's a mess. Mm -hmm. And the only reason we get in the war, we don't want to fight Nazis even. We get in the war because of Pearl Harbor. And at that point, we're just fighting Japan. We don't declare war against Germany. We don't want to fight Nazis. We're like, we're going to fight Japan because they attacked us. And it's Adolf Hitler, who is other great miscalculation, is he declares war on the United States. They say the day that Pearl Harbor happens and we declare war on the Japanese, Adolf Hitler slaps his leg in delight and says this is the greatest thing that's ever happened and I'm gonna declare war on them. He says strong people declare war. They don't wait to have war declared on them. And it's a giant miscalculation by him. And Winston Churchill remembers this one thing, this one quote about America. And he says that America is like a gigantic boiler. And once you light a fighter under it, there's no amount of energy that it won't produce. It'll just unbelievable burn. And he's actually right, right? We get our fire lit and that power comes immediately. And, and Hitler is the one who's now makes everyone scramble together. But that miscalculation obviously costs him forever. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God <laughs> Thank is God. right. I mean, a hundred percent. And, and to me, you know, when you, when you look at this story, you're like, how do you not, how do you even know these details? And what was amazing to me is, you know, back then the Nazis used to keep their top intelligence on what they called brown sheets. They were little brown sheets of paper is why they got the nickname. They were very good with code words, as you can tell, too, there. Mm -hmm. and, but one of the things they did is they would lock them up and you had to destroy them after you read them. It was like the Mission Impossible grief case for Nazis. But uh, one of their, their head of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, used to keep extensive diaries. And he would write all the secrets that he learned on the brown sheets in his diaries. And it's there we were able to see that, you know, how in the Enigma machines, we cracked the Nazi codes. I didn't know they had cracked ours. Mm. They were listening in and had the international cables between FDR and Winston Churchill. We don't know to this moment the exact date they knew about the big three meeting, but they knew the big three were meeting in Tehran. They had a guy on the ground. They had auto scores, any of this Nazi who was ready to kill, and they had an opportunity. I'm fascinated by how much of our understanding of this period really comes from that diary. Goebbels, Goebbels' diary is like the, you know, back backroom conversations, like it, it, his reflections from moment to moment, how they, you know, uh, went back and forth from different, you know, variations on fascism and their understanding of it. So much of it comes from from really that one document. I mean, yeah, I, and and most of this, I will say, most of this, did, most of the plot to kill them did not come from them. We got pieces hmm. and, and bits of how they got information, but we were relying on you know, the NKVD, the precursor mm -hmm. to the KGB, right? Russian intelligence. We had some things from there that we were trying to figure out, but it's one of the greatest secret keepers in the whole universe. We had the Nazi documents that we could find. Half of them were destroyed. They mm. destroyed some, we destroyed some. And, you know, so we're, we're piecing this thing together. And it was obviously amazing to watch. There was a, a 19 year old guy on the NKVD who was part of what they call the, the light cavalry. He used to ride his bicycle around Iran. 
and he's the guy who stumbles on a group of Nazi parachuters who come in. It's a 19-year-old kid, a 19-year-old kid who's responsible for arguably changing history, and he winds up you know, giving a big speech about it years and years later, and right before he dies, he backs up the story. And right be, you know, he, and, and to me, deathbed confessions, when you're about to die, you know, that's when you don't want to lie anymore. People want the truth <laughs> yeah, out. And he's yeah. like, this is what happened to me on that day. And that story was wow. an incredible piece of this as well. How, how, I mean, going, you can find a story like this and you know it's a great story, but you don't know at the beginning of this, you're going to be able to dig up all this detail, enough detail to write a book about it, right? Like you, you go into that research process hoping you're going to be able to dig up this stuff, but you don't know. No, that's, and the hard part is, you know, I'm amazed at how many historians today will write books and say, here's exactly what happened. I know everything. And I'm like, that's completely reckless. You can't possibly know everything in this. So much is lost. And all the people who were there, almost all of them are dead. So we tell you in the book, listen, we don't know, nobody knows the date that the big three, that it was revealed and the Nazis figured out that they were all meeting together. Mm. We say there are pieces of this puzzle that are missing. We don't know. We also know Otto Skorzeny, who I mentioned, this, you know, this Nazi fighter, later in the war, he's like, I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with it. He said, they asked me to go and kill them, but I didn't do it. I didn't want any in on it. Now, you're like, oh, then he didn't, then he didn't do it. Except they knew if he said he was going to do it, we would have hung him. Like, he right. would, have been, yeah. he would have been a dead man. So you've you got to look at the motivations. And, and I think one of the things you realize is what, uh, this story, when it came out, when FDR first comes back and says, yeah, the Nazis tried to kill us, it makes the front page of every newspaper. And then Normandy happens, and it becomes a footnote. The Nazi conspiracy mm -hmm. story gets lost. And what is interesting to me is that the Soviets had a big part in saving the day. They were, their intelligence was one of the groups that actually found out what the Nazis were up to. But as the Cold War erupted, here in America, we don't want to tell stories where the Russians are the good guys. So the story about this plot shifts. Mm. And it becomes, oh, the Russians were trying to trick us. It was trying to do that. They start calling it Operation Long Jump, even though there's no proof it was ever called Long Jump. And, and the details shift over time. And to me, it proves that, I don't know how to say it, but History is not like math. There's not just one answer. There are perspectives. And depending on whose perspective you hear, you get a different story.